everybody? Good. Well, I'm so glad to see so many wonderful faces. Um, as you know, we have a very special uh, guest speaker tonight. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about who that person is. Um, so we're very happy to have Dr. Casey Clardy with us. Um, Casey, well, she, uh, just a little bit of background about her, she has a Master's of Divinity from um, Fuller Theological Seminary. She also has a PhD in clinical psychology from Fuller Graduate School, right? And she's currently the Director of Behavioral Health at Lawndale Christian Counseling Center in the Chicago area. So Casey and I met randomly, it seemed, um, at a conference uh, through a mutual friend. And Casey proceeded to tell me about her journey to orthodoxy. And I remember as she was talking, I was like, you know what, I, I, I literally said this to her. I want to record what you're saying right now because I want to uh, play it for the youth in our church. Because <laughs> what you're saying is amazing. And then I'm like, wait a minute, why didn't you come and tell your story? Uh, I don't have to record it. And so she graciously um, accepted the invitation to come and tell us her story in person. So I hope that you all um, are touched with her story as, as I have, and I only heard a little bit of it. So um, I'm so glad to have Casey here. So thank you for coming. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. In his 13th chapter, St. Matthew writes, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant man seeking the finest pearls, who when he found the pearl of greatest price, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. So Christ's parable of the pearl of greatest price really resonates with me um, as I think about my own story. And I'm so thankful to Abuna and to Sophie for inviting me here tonight to share just a little bit about not anything of me, but what God has done in my life and in leading me not to the Orthodox Church, not away from the Orthodox Church, but actually into the Orthodox Church. And I keep taking those steps day by day um, and week by week and now year by year. So this has actually um, been a, quite a journey for me. So I'm going to share a little bit about that um, with you all tonight. So when we think about the pearl of greatest price, as I look into this parable, it's interesting to me that Christ talks it and uses this parable, and it it's right after the parable about the treasure that is in the field. So if you guys remember, um, the person who went and found the greatest treasure in the field, he immediately found the treasure in the field, sold all he had, and right away entered into joy and pursued the treasure that was in the field. Then Christ has this parable where it talks about the pearl of greatest price. Well, a couple of things stand out to me about this parable. This merchant man, back in the time of Christ, when Christ would have been referencing this, pearls had much higher value than pearls have today. Who, who, who here has a string of pearls, a pearl ring, pearl earrings, or your mom does, or your grandmother, anybody? Yes. Your girlfriend, your wife, someone that you want to maybe date has some pearls that you know? Yes. So back then, pearls had a much higher value than the, even than they do today. Um, so this would have been significant. This would have caught people's attention, that this is something that was really worthy to pursue. Um, the merchant, it's interesting too to note, the merchant already had several pearls. And what is it that he did not, he, but he did not have the pearl of greatest value. And so um, this merchant, the merchant, the concept of that would have been someone who is seeking knowledge. So this merchant is seeking out the um, pearl of greatest price, and once he found it, he sold all that he had. So he even sold some of those small pearls that he was already in possession of in order to cash in and really pursue that one greatest pearl. Um, so I think to me this really resonates as I think about my story. I am no stranger to Christ and to the church, the Little C Church though. I grew up um, as a Protestant my entire life and was baptized in the Protestant church when I was 11 years old and uh, my mom was a huge influence in my life in leading me to Christ and we were in church every time the door opened, probably many, like many of you, Wednesday night, Saturday, Sunday, anytime there was an event we were always there serving and praising God and singing together 
together in the choir and reading scripture and learning about Jesus Christ, learning about stories from the Bible and serving in ministry. Um, and I had a very full and rich spiritual life and the Holy Spirit guided me um, throughout my entire childhood and into the faith and um, as well as um, in high school and had different Christian friends and that was very helpful to me along my spiritual journey and then into college. Um, I went to a Christian college. I'm originally, if you can't tell from the accent already, I'm originally, I'm originally from uh, the southern United States from Alabama um, and so I went, went to Samford University and met a wonderful group of uh, Christian friends there and um, that just really energized my, my faith at that point and um, really solidified a lot of things for me and that was a key point of my growth. Um, so those were some of the, I would say, small pearls that I had. I had a rich faith. I had um, a very clear sense that I was a Christian. I grew up in a very tiny church with a lot of old people, so there was not a ton of youth like there are now. I would have loved for a youth group or college group this size. Um, my brother and I were, were the main people in our youth group. Um, and so really, I really feel like I had to learn to make my faith my own um, and to learn to serve um, in the church. And so those, I think, were some of the riches that I did have um, and some of the, the small pearls, if you will. So as I went on, um, the Lord led me eventually to go to seminary. As I was thinking about after college, you know, I was a psychology major and I thought, well, what should I do now? Um, and I decided, I was trying to decide, should I go to seminary and pursue a counseling degree or should I go to grad school for psychology and then figure out this whole ministry thing on, on my own, you know, and figure out how to be a Christian counselor or something like that. And I actually found the program at Fuller, which you could be a PhD in psychology and it was the foremost Protestant seminary in the whole world. World. And so I thought, well, perfect. I don't have to compromise on either. I'll just go there. And it's in California. And that'll be way different from Alabama. I'll uh, drive out with my brother on a road trip and we'll uh, go out there and that'll be really fun. So it also had a lot of, you know, diverse cultures and things that are very important to me. So it, to me, it seemed like a natural fit. So who was the first person that I met in my grad school orientation? Could have been any one of you. Orthodox woman, young woman who moved from Maryland, like most of you guys, right? You're from Maryland, California, or this neck of the woods, right? And moved over to California. She was starting um, her graduate school program in psychology. She and her husband had moved there. And um, I immediately took to her and was just talking to her and asking and finding out about her at orientation. And I said, Oh, well, what kind of church do you go to? And she said, Coptic Orthodox. And I thought, what is that? Okay, so I just noted, okay, I'll come back to that. I'm curious about this girl. Um, so that, long story short, it ended up um, befriending her and um, she welcomed me into her home over our entire six years of grad school and just became really close with she and her family. And um, that is a big reason why I'm standing here in front of you guys today. And so I think that is such a key thing um, when we think about welcoming people into the church is relationship. Um, and so a big part of my story starts with my friend Naveen. Um, and so she's who I met uh, at that first grad school orientation. I had no idea what God had in store for me when I first met her and learned about what is Coptic Orthodox. So that was really my first introduction to orthodoxy. So the more I got to know Naveen and we were in theology classes and psychology classes and I was over at her home and I will never forget the first time she invited me over to dinner. I come over and all of a sudden there's a huge icon over her couch. <laughs> when I walked in I thought, oh, what is this? I've never seen an icon before and it was very startling. Like, am I supposed to sit under that? Am I allowed to sit on the couch? Like Christ is right there. Okay, and then there's another one of, of the Virgin Mary. What is that? It was a little bit weirded out, right? I did not grow up with icons. I did not know anything about that. I wasn't quite sure anything of that. Um, and so I just sat there. Okay, this is still Naveen. I'm still going to talk to her. She's still a normal person. She She's very solid in her faith. We can connect on a number of different things. And this is part of my story, right? I'm connected to Naveen, who I'm very close to, and yet I'm tiptoeing my way into these other things that are a little bit strange to me. Um, but I still feel very comfortable and grounded because I know, you know, we're tracking as far as faith and friendship and those things go. So 
I ask a lot of questions. So I just started asking her question after question, not all at once, right, but little by little, especially over that first year of getting to know she and her family. So finally it comes time, Lent passes me by, because I've never really paid attention to Lent before, right, but all of a sudden they start talking about Pascha. What is Pascha? Easter. Oh, okay, Easter's coming. Um, and I said, wait, your Holy Week is coming up? Can I come? And they were just like, well, sure, yeah, there's a service that you could go. I said, no, 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 I want to do Holy Week. You guys are doing all these other things. Can I come? And they, I think they thought I was kidding or maybe that I would come to maybe like, you know, Saturday night or whatever. But I said, oh, no, whenever you guys go, I want to go. Can you please bring me along? Like, I'll come night, day, whenever you want. Um, and they said, Okay, but it's really intense. And I was like, no, 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 this will be fine. It'll be Holy Week. I want to do everything like you guys are doing. I want to learn. They're like, it's really intense. <laughs> and I said, that's no problem. So anyway, so I end up going night and day and night and day. And we didn't have screens in California at that time. Some of the churches we visited did, but most didn't. So I sat in the pew and just kind of took it all in. The first time I came in, I was like, I'm in another world. Where am I? But the truth of what was on the screen, the truth of what was in the books, I could connect to. So much of it I had no problem with. This is the gospel. Okay, no problem. This is the scripture. Sure, great. But what are some of these other things, though? And so I say this to say that so much of what was happening, I think the profound mystery of what happens when we were in the church, we cannot explain. We just can't explain. We, as you guys know, we sung Tog Teti Gom how many times during the whole week, right? And every night it would build and I'd learn a new phrase and I'd learn a new phrase. And every night, my friend Amin was so diligent, she would write out the transliteration of what was happening. So I had all these pieces of paper with how to say each word. And that sounds silly, right? Because she probably thought, oh, I'm just writing this out, passing the time. But that's what helped me to connect and to participate and engage because I'm a Protestant and I'm used to singing in church choirs my whole life. So the idea that I would come into a church and not be able to sing along or to be able to read fast enough or anything like that is strange to me. So I want to be able to participate. And so she knew that though. She knew who she was bringing into the church. And so she wrote it down and took the time to like spell out all of those things and to translate what was going on. Um, so I would sing right along, um, and the, I think the power, though, of the Holy Spirit and what's being communicated in those hymns, in the Coptic, in the Arabic, it didn't matter that I didn't know what word was being said at every time. Something was happening in my soul just by participating in that and just by singing that and um, following along with their readings and moving along in the rhythms of the church. And I had no idea. I thought I was just a curious observer. I just thought I was a visitor. Um, and little did I know, something was stirring and God was planting those seeds, kind of like the parable of the sower, into my life. And I had no idea at that time. She had a really good community out there in California, and so many of the youth and other college people, they were, um, you know, in the other grad school fellowship folks, they would all go to dinner every night after liturgy, and so I would just tag along and, you know, was just listening and kind of getting to know people. And at some point during the week, somebody leaned over and was like, is she going to convert? She's like coming night and day and night and day. Like, is she converting? And I remember hearing that and thinking to myself, oh, that is hilarious. No way am I converting. What are you talking about? Like, no, I'm just coming as an experiment. Little did I know, almost a decade later, that I would end up actually joining the Orthodox Church. But at that point, that was the furthest thing um, from my mind. So it's interesting that there's been a lot of twists and turns um, in my journey. So as we think about even just the powerful hymns that we sing throughout Holy Week, maybe two, three, four years later after that time, after going to, to Holy Week and hearing thine be the power and the glory, you know, tog te te gom, I still remember every word of that song in the Coptic, in the Arabic, every line. I can sing it for you right now if we all want to start singing it. I could do it. Not because I've been to the Coptic Church every year since then. From that one Holy Week, something was written in my spirit. I firmly believe that that has been imprinted onto me. It would be two or three years later. I, nothing would remind me of that. I'd be at a red light. And all of a sudden, that would come back to mind. Whenever the chaos, the busyness would kind of subside, 
that would float back up. I should not have remembered that. I do not speak Coptic. I'm not around Coptic enough, right? There's no explanation for these things other than something was happening. And there's something I think that God wanted me to still hold on to. Another pearl, if you will. I had a lot of small pearls already, but then there was another, there was more small pearls being added little by little when I didn't even realize it. So that song carries some special uh, significance for me for sure as a part of my journey. Another part of the journey, too, during that same Holy Week, that first year that I went, um, it was on Lazarus Saturday, and I knew very clearly I am not to go forward for communion. No way. I knew that was like a no-no. I'm not in the Orthodox Church. I didn't quite understand why or, or what, but I knew that that wasn't something that I was supposed to do. So we were in a very large church. A lot of chaos was going on, right, when, we were, um, when, when people are going forward for communion. And... I don't know, I can't explain this, but for some reason, as people were standing and all the women were going, my friend Naveen, she was helping serve and kind of, you know, corral the women into a particular line. So she was already off doing something else and I was kind of by myself. For some reason, I found myself standing and going along with the whole line and I'm tiptoeing around the line and I go up and I don't know why. At that moment, I thought it was okay to go forward. <laughs> And I did receive. Abuna had no idea, and he just kind of kept going. And I, I, I don't know. I can't explain what happened. I think for some reason, the Lord is merciful and allowed me to partake, even though that was not what should have happened, and kind of just deleted that from my memory. I, I don't really know. I, I can't explain some of these things. But when I look back and I think about that, receiving that gift that day, that is something that I held on to for so many years after, and that compelled me forward in my journey. Later, when I realized the grave nature of what I just did, I was like so apologetic. And like, I need to go to Obuna right now. I need to confess. I need to tell him I'm not even in the church, but I can't believe what just happened. How did this happen? And they said, you know, halas, relax. It's some kind of miracle of what just happened. You clearly knew not to do that beforehand, but for some reason in that moment, you felt compelled, and it happened. And no, you're not going to do it again but what do we do with this? And so many times when I talked to people afterwards, they said, well, you need to be in the church. We need to get you into the Orthodox Church. This happened to you. And for me, that really stuck out to me um, for a lot of years of why would God allow that? How, how can this be? And this matters. I knew that that was very significant. And so a part of me always still felt connected to that, that there is something different about what I just received. And I do need to seek out this great pearl. Is this really the pearl of greatest price? Is this something that I need to pursue? Is there something beyond what I already know of Christ and his church? And Something about that kept me still invested. And I do think it was the power of receiving the body, capital B and the blood, capital blood, that compelled me forward to seek out what it truly was and to be truly in communion with the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. So that was the first um, sin that I confessed. When I finally had my confession years later, that was my, the first of many uh, that I did, that did confess with my father of confession. So that was my first year of grad school. I remember after Holy Week, it was a very long time. I was doing a lot of prostrations on Holy Friday, and um, you know, it was a beautiful time. And I remember one of my reflections at the end of that week was, wow, the Coptics, they're intense, but they're serious about their faith. And um, I felt very much a sense of awe and reverence and holiness in the church then. Um, and afterwards, as I would read different things in grad school and in seminary, to me it was always like another question mark of what was on my list, of questions that I don't have resolved from, from seminary. Um, but I didn't know how far to really take that. I can remember, I don't know if anybody of you have read any books by Clark Carlton. He's written books on the, what's called The Way, The Truth, The Life. Um, I can remember that was really my, my first Orthodox book that I ever read. I was sitting in a very tiny apartment, 400 square feet in California, and I was sitting on my couch, and the very first paragraph, he's like, beware to whom much is given, much is required. If you read this book, you are accountable for its, in, its contents. If you start reading about the Orthodox Church, watch out. You will be at the judgment seat of Christ and you will know what you have been reading. And I remember being terrified because remember, I've already been to Holy Week. 
Okay, so this is Holy Week, and then I'm starting to read my first Orthodox book. I was, I threw the book across the room. I was like, no, 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 God, I can't do this yet, no. I'm not ready. And then later I went and picked the book up and started reading a little bit, a little bit, but it was terrifying to me, because I think this whole time I somewhere have known this is the pearl of greatest price. I don't know if I'm ready to even go, go, go touch it or even go look for it yet. But I do, I'm in pursuit of truth. I'm in pursuit of knowledge. God, if you are not a part of this, I don't want any part of it. But if there is more, if this is the way, okay, help me, help me. I believe, help my unbelief. That has been definitely um, a big part of my journey. So I threw the book, and then eventually I went and picked it up and started reading a little bit more. But I'm busy. I'm in grad school, right? I'm writing a dissertation. I'm going to different practicums. I'm learning how to be a therapist. I'm doing all these different things. I don't have time to figure out about orthodoxy and read a bunch of extra books. So I kind of put that on hold for a while while I was in grad school. Um, eventually, but anytime I would come to a church history class or anything about the sacraments, I was all ears. I can remember the last, one of the last papers I wrote for one of my theology classes um, in graduate school was a paper, you know, that shouldn't have taken, um, you know, more than, I don't know, let's say six hours, something like that. It was the hardest paper of my entire graduate school career, harder than my dissertation, harder than any long psychology paper, because I had chosen, this was my topic. What did the church fathers believe about Holy Communion? Because buddy, I was, it was still on my list of questions, right? Communion was still something that I was trying to figure out. That was my number one first roadblock or hang up. If I could get past that, or if I could dismiss it, then I wouldn't have to worry about that great pearl over there. I could just continue my Protestant life and not have to worry about it. And that was great for Naveen and her family, and I'll definitely attend, but there's no difference, right? But if communion is different, that's the game changer. So I had to start there. That was my biggest thing to figure out in my humble arrogance at that time. So that was my, my thesis. So it was the church fathers believed different things about communion. That was my thesis that I was going to prove, right? Well, you can bet how far I got trying to prove that. No. So I took so many hours. I can remember being at the library till after it closed, being at the lab and just stressing over all this research and coming around and round and round and round and realizing, well, they all believe the same thing. It is the body and the blood. There was one who defected, and we don't consider him a church father, and this is the problem. So how can I write this paper? And at the last hour, I had to rewrite the entire paper. I'm there with the backspace key. Okay, I guess I have to change my thesis. The church was unanimous. The church was an accord. The church was an agreement. This is the body and blood of Christ. There is no question. There was all consensus, and so now moving forward. So I finished the paper in about 45 minutes, even though I had taken so, so many hours. And so these to me are some of the different signposts along the timeline of just my, my wrestling with this topic. And I think I picked up another pearl that day. I had an academic understanding of what communion was, but it had not sunk its way down into my heart, into my spirit, into my spiritual life, into my understanding. But that was another marker on the timeline for sure. And that stuck out to me. Why was it so hard to write that paper? Why was I so invested in disproving that thesis? Why was it so hard to accept? Because maybe I would have to do something about it if this was true. And so I think when I came to the end of my time um, in graduate school, I had already matched for my residency. I knew I was moving to Chicago. Um, and I said, well, to each his own, right? I'm not Coptic. There's not a Southern Orthodox church anywhere. What's good for them is what's good for me. Yes, I think that there's some true things in the Orthodox Church, of course. There's true things in every church, but what does that have to do with me? It took me a really long time to find a church in graduate school. I think part of it was because my mind got warped. I got poked at the gom into my body and my soul that first year, and it took me a really long time to find a church then. I think largely in part because, because of that experience that first year. But I eventually ended up in, a, in an evangelical church plant for the last couple of years in graduate school. Um, 
but then thinking about starting over, thinking about moving to Chicago and moving to a new place. When I first moved out here, I think I got here on like a Thursday or Friday, and I was already thinking about Sunday. Where am I going to go to church? I don't know anybody for a thousand miles. I don't start work until Monday. Where am I going to go? Of course, what floated back up? Yes, that's right. How did you know? We're going to sing this when when we end here tonight, maybe. Um, That's what floated back up. You could go to an Orthodox church. Why not? You don't know anybody. You don't have anything to do. You finished all your classes. Maybe you can deal with this now. So I Google, okay, where is one? All right, there's one downtown, there's one over here. Fine, fine, fine. How would I get there? Okay. And then I close the computer. God, I can't do that right now. I just moved to Chicago. I need to find friends. I don't know if those people are going to be normal. I need to find solid Christian friends here. I'm about to start a very demanding internship. Like, I can't can't do that right now. That would be pulling the rug out from under me. No, 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 no. Okay, so I went to the Protestant church two blocks down from where I lived in Oak Park, and it was a wonderful church. I ended up actually going back there later and, um, you know, being at that church for a number of years. But in the stillness, when the chaos would subside, in a moment of transition, there's the truth of the church that comes right back up. Orthodoxy never left. I left it a million times, throwing it away. No! no, please don't. I'll do anything but this. It kept coming back and coming back and coming back. And so um, I ended up, again, I'm in Chicago. I'm um, away from everybody that I know. I'm involved in, um, I ended up in that church that was a couple blocks away and started, you know, getting involved, getting to know a community, had really wonderful teaching and um, great ministry opportunities, and I grew a lot in that church. Um, That was another small pearl that I got along the way. Um, I had a really good experience there. And I think, when I think about the weight of that great pearl, when does it start to outweigh the small pearls? At some point during my time in Chicago, I've been here now six years, I'd say probably a couple of years in, once I got a little more established in my job, once I got to Lawndale, I'm serving on the west side, I'm seeing a lot of hard things in my job. So I'm very busy, it's a very demanding job being a psychologist in the hood, in Chicago, all day, every day. And then I would just come home. Once the chaos and the busyness all would sort of subside. What would come back? Not just Tote de Gom, but also, hey, what about orthodoxy? You haven't resolved any of those questions yet. What about that? Christ, I felt like I had. Understanding the scripture, sure, I don't understand everything, but those things I have, but I don't know what I'm going to do about this other yet. So it was always this pursuit of knowledge, always this pursuit of truth. So I started online. I said, you know what? Let me just start researching. This turns into one book, two books, three books, four books. Ancient Faith Radio. Do any of you guys ever listen to that? Well, I went down that rabbit hole. (laughs) And I never left. So once I started logging into Ancient Faith Radio, I was done. I'd be listening to podcasts, washing the dishes, baking brownies, cleaning all night my house, podcast after podcast after podcast. Then finally got to the point where I was just leaving it on in my living room. Listening to different chanting? What is this? And so little by little, it started to creep more into other parts of my life. I would come home, and maybe after a stressful day, I would turn on Ancient Faith Radio, and all of a sudden, I felt more relaxed. The hymns of the church could be relaxing. Oh, okay, well, I'm used to relaxing to other Protestant hymns, not these hymns, but okay. So it was definitely um, a shift for me. So I would come home from a very difficult day, but all of a sudden, be just mesmerized by anything that I could read about orthodoxy. And so I would start reading until midnight. I mean, I would get home, read, 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 the next night, read, 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 and just become consumed with this. But at that point, it was still just an intellectual exercise, right? I had all these questions on my list that I was trying to cross off. What about the Theotokos? What about icons? I'm not distrustful of it, but at the same time, I'm just looking for, is there a way that I can cross some of those? Is there something that I can find that I cannot get on board with? And it still hasn't happened. It's taken a long time, 
but it still hasn't happened. And so I think as I research and I research and, you know, I went to seminary, I got my MDiv and that just means that I know how to ask questions. I don't know any answers necessarily, but I know how to ask some of the questions. And so as I would read, I would see how sound the theology was. I started seeing things come together like free will and predestination. I never, I thought they were always opposites. Well, in orthodoxy, they finally can shake hands very easily. And it was like light bulbs would come on, come on all the time. And as I would see the consensus of the church fathers and it would point to the truth and it was just so energizing and confirming and I would find myself agreeing and agreeing and you know we think about all these parallels to dating and to marriage and it was just like getting to know somebody the more I would read about the Orthodox Church the more I would start to trust her the more I would start finding myself as I'm reading articles I'd be arguing on the side of the Orthodox Church without realizing it well I'm sure it's gonna make sense in a minute just hang on wait and find another article that Orthodox writer didn't they didn't do it justice no find somebody else that makes the point better because I was arguing in favor of Orthodoxy before I even realized it and so I just kept going and kept going and, you know, seasons change, hard things happen. I ran into some hardships at work and some really difficult things in my personal life and put the brakes on orthodoxy for a little bit, right? Okay, I can't deal with this right now, God. Hold on. But I had that cognitive, that knowledge part, right? So then some months went on by, months went on by, and then sure enough, when the chaos, when the busyness, when the stressful things stopped, that's when orthodoxy came back up. And so that time it was, okay, I forget which year it was, but it was one of the years where Protestant and Orthodox Easter were the same. And my friends Naveen and Jimmy, they were actually coming from Maryland to visit because another friend of ours, their child was getting baptized and all these other things. So they ended up coming to visit. And I said, okay, you guys are coming. Easter's are on the same year. Let's do this. We're going to figure this thing out. I am tired of this journey. Like, let's go to all the services that we can. Let's do Protestant Easter. Let's do Coptic Easter. I'm going to figure this out. Let's do it. So I didn't figure it out then, but they, they came. We did it. We, we went to St. Paul's um, in Chicago, and we did, you know, all the different services. And it was this interesting moment. This is exactly one year before I joined the Orthodox Church. We go to Good Friday at the Coptic Church. A lovely day. One of my favorite days of the whole year. We go to that. Then I am serving or in a ministry role, I'm like leading part of the Good Friday service at my Protestant church. So I'm like one of the readers. I have to be there, you know, at like five o'clock because it starts at six or whatever. But we're not done singing. Like I have to pull myself out of the Coptic church at like 415 so I can make it across town in Chicago traffic to go over to my Protestant church because I got to be there on time and, and serve. And I just remember this great sadness of, I don't want to go over there. I want to stay here. I wasn't even thinking that. I was just going with my friends because they're here and, and whatever. But it was this feeling of, wait a minute. I belong over here. I don't even want to go do that. Even though I'd been preparing for it, I helped organize the service, and I was supposed to be leading it, right? You know, again, but I'm, I wasn't in that other space right then. It was being in the church. Worshiping in the church is what changes you. You can't think about it on the outside. Do I want to go to church today or not? You've always picked no, well, most times, right? But you have to be in the church. Doing it is what changes us. The liturgy is the work of the people. So as I was doing the work of the people, that's what, wait a minute, why would I leave here? Where do I need to be other than on Good Holy Friday, other than in the capital C church? So I left my friends, I gave them my car, I took an Uber, and I still had to go because I had to go over to the Protestant church and hurry up because they were waiting on me to, to do the readings. But I had that sense of sadness. So I thought, okay, what is that? So then go on several weeks, several months after, and that really stuck me with me, feeling torn between the two Easters that year. So that next year, I said, okay, God, I'm done with books. I'm done with research. I'm in a Protestant church that I love. It's the best Protestant church. I'd argue that, that there is. The, certainly the best one I've ever been. Wonderful preaching, wonderful teaching, excellent community, great worship, diverse. You can't ask for anything better. I'm growing. I feel alive. I'm not stagnant. I'm not disgruntled. I'm not burned out. I wasn't hurt by the church. I love my Protestant church. I don't want to leave. 
But God, if there is something more, if there is a pearl of greatest price, you're going to have to do it. I'm open. I'm willing. But you're going to have to lead me there. I, believe, I believed in my head that the Orthodox Church was the true church. But the question was, do I have to do anything about it? What does that mean for me? So I said, okay, you, God, you're going to have to move my heart. You're going to have to move my will. You're going to have to move a lot because my emotions aren't in it. I don't want to do that. And I feel like I'm still growing over here. So now what do we do? It's up to you, God. So time passes, time passes. I finally said, you have got to get out of your house and go to an Orthodox church by yourself. Not with your friends taking you and I'm, I'm Naveen's guest. Hi, I'm just the white girl in the back of the row. I'm fine. Hi, guys. No, you need to go yourself and go in there and see what it's like for yourself. So I finally go to that Orthodox church in downtown and I sit outside. Y'all, I've read, I don't know how many books at this point, how many articles. I know a little bit about orthodoxy at this point. I stood outside in my car, terrified to even go in. I waited throughout the whole service. I just sat there in my car like, should I go in, should I not? Should I go in, should I not? I was petrified. Because I think still even then somewhere, I knew what was on the line. If I actually pursue this pearl, this is going to change everything. And I don't know if I'm ready to do that yet. I am Jonah still running, still running. Because to become in submission to the church, you have to lay down your own will. You can no longer be in charge of your own life. I am no longer on the throne of my own experience of what I think is right and true and makes sense and is sound. I have to do what the church, capital C, says. I have to follow what Christ and his apostles have laid forth. I'm no longer in charge. And that's terrifying. I don't know what might happen if that happens. So I wait through almost the entire service. I don't get in. And all of a sudden, I see the people streaming out with their Palm Sunday branches. I was like, great. You went all this way. You were debated about whether you should go. And now the service is over. Way to go. I was like, okay, you have to go in. The service is over. Just go and stand in and look around and then be done. And then you can go home. Five minutes, whatever. So I go in there. Of course, the priest greets me, you know, and like gives me a palm. Okay, here we are. And um, I felt such a sense of peace in there. Peace. Overwhelming. So I said a prayer, took my palm, went out and said, okay, you're going to start visiting an Orthodox church. Maybe you do your Protestant, you know, whenever you have to serve at your Protestant church, and then if you don't have anything on the calendar there, you need to be in an Orthodox church. You've got to put your feet to this and figure this out. Be, res be responsive if there is something else. So I started visiting several different ones and really um, feeling the sense of call and connection. And little by little, as I was ta started talking to a few people, realizing that my heart may not fully be on board yet, but that's part of what the church does. The more we sing the hymns, the more we pray prayers, that's what forms us. We don't form the church. I'm waiting for the church to form me. And little by little, I, I can't wait until my emotions get in line necessarily. That's what the church does to me, and that's what I've experienced. So fast forward to June 2014, maybe, and I finally got to the point where I told a good friend of mine who's very Protestant, very solid, and very honest. And I said, you know what? I'm really far down the road with this orthodoxy thing. What do you think? I'm just still, my heart, my head's on board, but my heart is not. And she finally, she said to me, she said, Casey, you know what? I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray that either you, God gives you the emotions for it, and that your heart gets on board, and that you just jump and do it, or you just do it without that. Just go for it. And I was like, wait, what? You mean either way, that means becoming orthodox, right? <laughs> like, you're not trying to talk me out of this. You don't think this is heretical. You don't think this is a bad idea. You're not trying to convince me otherwise. She's like, no, 
you've researched this, you've read this, you've prayed about this, this has been years, like what are you waiting for? Either way, I'm hoping that you just take the next step. So something about that I think gave me some permission. So she told me that at 11 a.m. on the parking lot of Ulta outside of Oak Park, Illinois, that night I read um, Searching for God in a Land of Shallow Wells. If no one has read that, I highly recommend. I see some head nods. Searching for God in a Land of Shallow Wells. That book was a game changer talking about the emotional peace and what if we don't feel connected and what happens when we feel dry in the liturgy and all these things. Um, I read that book that night and all of a sudden I was like, okay, I'm doing this. I can remember it was pitch black in my room and I said out loud, God, I declare my intention to become part of the Orthodox Church. I made the sign of the cross. I held up my arms and I said the Lord's Prayer. I didn't know what else to do. That seemed pretty official to me. But I, I had to say it out loud, though, because I was like, I, I don't want to talk myself out of it. You know, I need to, like, declare this out. I, like, wrote it in my phone today on this day. At this time, I'm going to do it. Um, and so that kind of brought forth that summer and said, okay, I'm going to wrap up my responsibilities at my Protestant church this summer. I'm going to talk more to my head pastor again, because I had been in dialogue with them throughout the time, and I'm going to transition out. And I did. And I started visiting around different other Orthodox parishes, and okay, now that I'm going to be Orthodox, which Orthodox parish? My goodness. And that was its own story that can be another evening, but um, really feeling a place where I felt at home and welcomed and could see the truth of the pearl of greatest price. That was what I was after. And so then I had to have the daunting conversation of selling all that I had. So I had a lot of small pearls, remember. I didn't, it wasn't that I had, didn't have any pearls. I had pearls. I had to sell them, though, in order to get the pearl of the greatest price. So remember, I don't know anybody coming to Chicago, but I have now created a community outside of this very large, very wonderful Protestant church. All of my friends, all of my network, everybody, it's multi-generational. And now I have to say goodbye transition out. Some of these people might mock me. They might make fun of me. They may reject me. They may not text me or hang out with me. Like I'm putting myself out there of saying, okay, I'd still like to be friends with you guys, but I'm actually going to do something wildly different. And our faith is our main connection. All of my close friends from college, our main connection is our faith and they're all Protestants. My one friend, Naveen, is really my only close Orthodox friend. And my friends are my life, my, every, my community, you know, what am I going to do without that? I have to also, I don't know, tell my family, what are they going to think? What are they going to say? Protestants, do they even know what orthodoxy is? They've met Naveen and Jimmy, but what, what, what else about that? So I took a very big breath, and we went on a family trip to Seattle that summer, and we were there for several days, and of course I'm stewing, when am I gonna tell them, how am I gonna tell them, what am I gonna say, what are they gonna say back? And I waited till the very last minute, about 40 minutes before I go to the airport, because I'm like, well, they're not gonna ask or bring it up, they don't even know this is on the table. And eventually, um, over a very um, uncomfortable dinner, I said, well, I think I'm gonna become Orthodox. <laughs> Here's a little bit of the story. And they were super humble and gracious and very patient and compassionate and listened and asked questions and was distressed and prayed and figured out and, you know, were, were very wonderful about the whole thing. But and that, you know, sparked a lot of other conversations and dialogue. And you see, my mom came with me here today. So praise God for that. Um, so I think taking a risk to pursue truth is what Christ always calls us to. I didn't have a bad experience with it. I certainly wasn't persecuted or martyred in any way. Um, but I did sit down for probably 40 to 45 hour to two hour conversations with a lot of people that summer. I have... God has blessed me with a, the network. And so that requires a lot of intense, serious conversations with people that I've been in a lot of different types of relationships with. And I think that was part of what I knew was on the line, part of why I took over a decade to really figure my stuff out, because I knew I was going to get so many questions. And you're going to do what? What is that? And so um, I think that's part of selling all that the, you have, is being able to say, you know what, this was my spiritual identity. And I'm willing for that now to be reformed, God, as you see fit. 
You are the potter. I am the clay, not the other way around. And so when I think about that, I, um, I really thought, even as I was coming into the church, and I finally um, decided which parish that I would start to attend and started meeting with Father and doing a catechism and all of these different things, and I realized that, okay, I found the greatest pearl. I'm willing to pursue it. This also means this is my greatest pearl for life. I'm not going to look for those other small pearls again. So I started reading the funeral service, the wedding service, all these different services, because if I'm being orthodox, this is it. So I need to read all of these possible things of what might happen to me or what might be involved, because there's no going back after this. You're not doing something else. This is the pearl. And so it was a really serious intentionality. And I was writing letters to the board of elders at my Protestant church and trying to help people understand why was I doing this and why did I have to. And it was because I was compelled by this truth of finding the pearl. And so now that I have it, all of the joy, all of the peace, all of the growth and the transformation I've never grown as much in all of those years in my Protestant life as I've grown in these last two years in being Orthodox. I'm in the Antiochian Orthodox, um, you know, diocese in Chicago and receiving the sacraments and participating in the liturgy and reading about the Church Fathers, but it's mainly being in the liturgy and participating in doing Holy Week now in a whole different way. That is what is changing me and continues to change me. When I stand before the icon of Christ and lay it out there in confession, that's what changes us. You can read all the books that you want, but that is the greatest pearl that we have. When I receive the body and blood of Christ and have had many different supernatural, unexplainable interactions with that and because of that, that's what changes us. It's nothing that we do. It's the pearl that we receive. But we have to know what its treasure is and what its value truly is. St. John Chrysostom, in talking about this parable, he says, He that possesses the pearl knows that he is rich, but others often do not know that they have a pearl in their hands because the pearl is not big. It's just the pearl of the greatest value. The same can also be said about the truth. Those possessing it know that they are rich, but unbelievers not understanding the value of this treasure do not know of our wealth. The golden mouth one, St. John Chrysostom. How true is that of the Orthodox Church? Sometimes we're not the sometimes we're the small, we're a small pearl, but we're the pearl of greatest value. And so we have to sell all that we have to seek after that and to know its true value. So what do I say to all of you today as we wrap up our time together? Why am I here? How am I here? How did God use, how did God use other people to get me here? Not that I'm someone that's that special or great, but I am an example of anybody that could come into the church. I'm here because somebody invited me. Who have you guys invited? Why don't you invite people to the liturgy? There's so many barriers to that, right? It's strange. It's weird. They don't understand. They don't know what orthodoxy is. They're Protestant. They're not Protestant. I don't know. They're secular. They're just my friend. Whatever. There's so many reasons that we put of why somebody would not be a good fit to come to the liturgy. Well, they look different than everybody that's in my church. Maybe they won't get it, or maybe they won't understand, or they don't speak Arabic, or whatever the case may be. Somebody invited me. That's how part of how I'm here. Somebody wrote out the transliteration so that I could participate and figure out what to say with the Hompek Digong. That's another reason why I'm here. I'm also here because priests listen to me. Can you imagine me sitting in the background and then eventually working up the courage to talk and then as soon as a priest asks why I'm here, I like launch into a speed version of that. I'm here because some really compassionate, wise priests listen to me and offered godly counsel to me. That's another reason why I'm here. I'm here because people talked to me after the liturgy. People smiled. 
If you ever see somebody that looks like me here in the church, they're not here. Well, no one's here by accident, but they're really not here by accident. They sought out to come here and they have a purpose and a mission to be here. So if you see someone, please talk to them and figure out, hey, how are you experiencing this? What's going on? What are you thinking? Like, where are you at with this? What's your story? What's your background? Why are you here? Why did you come seeking? Maybe they don't know what they're seeking, but they're seeking the greatest pearl. And here they are right here in your backyard. So please talk to them. Another reason why I'm here too is because the church doesn't water down the truth. That actually was the most attractive thing to me. Because remember, I had a wonderful Protestant church that I loved and I was growing in and everything was great and we had excellent music. We need to be the Orthodox Church and not be ashamed of that. There are some lines in the sand and we need to be okay with that. Because this is the pearl of greatest value. We don't need to try to put on some Protestant coverings, right? Because the Protestants will do it better. If somebody's here, we need to give them the truth of the one true holy and Catholic and apostolic church, what that means for them and why they need to do it. And we don't need to be ashamed because we have the true, found the truth faith. And there's a lot that comes with that. But that would be what would propel someone to make this huge jump and to sell all they had. Because if they don't know the value, why would they sell what they had? Many people already have the pearls, right? Just because we can sing some different praise choruses or have this really exciting youth game or whatever, right? Those are just the window dressing. If we don't talk about what makes the Orthodox Church unique, what makes the mystery, the value of the sacraments, the faith that has been passed down, why would anyone sell all they have to come here? They have to know the value, and we can't water that down. And we don't want to offend, and we need to do it in the course of time, right? And we don't need to start out with that. We need to build a relationship and all of these different things. But when it comes down to it and people are asking questions, we have to give them the answer. Lord, help us as much as we know is what the church teaches us. So I'm also here because people don't, have not watered it down, and they don't apologize for who we are. And I'm here also because of hospitality. That's something that Coptics know how to do very, very well. The Coptic Church sure does. And so that's a big reason why I'm here. Relationship. I knew from the day, first day that I met my friend Naveen, this is a normal, solid, wonderful girl who takes me into her family, who I can trust, I can count on. And if she believes some of these extra things to me at the time, I can hear her out. I can listen. I can explore together with her. And so because of that hospitality, that's what the Great Commission is all about. Going and sharing and telling. So to you guys I say, research. If you don't feel like you have found the pearl of greatest price, you're here. Does it feel valuable? Does it feel like it's the greatest pearl? Maybe some days, maybe some days not. Is it your parents' pearl or is it your pearl? Is it a bonus pearl? Is it your family's pearl? Is it, this is just what we do? Because we live here and this is what all of our families and our neighbors and what we're supposed to do? Or is this actually your capital P pearl? If it's not, figure out why. Pray about that. Research that and pursue that. Grow. All of the value is here. The sacraments, the icons, the liturgy, the services, the prayers. It's all here. I can't even believe I'm saying this to you all. Please understand what, what I'm saying here. I'm, I'm not lecturing you all. Just in great humility, I have seen, even in my small time in the church, you all have had years with the greatest pearl. Be sure to recognize the value for what it is. Grow, pray, research, and then share. Share that with other people. Share the value. Invite people to the pearl. Show them your pearl. Don't be afraid to do that. The Holy Spirit will go forth and will infuse that sharing, that risk that you take. Because we have sold all that we have, and here we are. And some of you have always had this pearl. Some of you have found this pearl later. But it's a pearl of greatest value nevertheless. 
And so we need to cherish it and clean it and polish it and store it in a really important place and be sure that we share it. What happens the first thing that when people get engaged? What do you do? Show off your ring. So, show it off. Thank you all.